All right, now I'm delighted to be joined by none other than James Rowe. He's a 22-year-old from Kildare originally, but now he's playing a straight over in the United States, living in Indianapolis, uh, and doing really well. He started off now in the Indy Pro 2000. It's his rookie season uh, over there, so he's doing really great thing, things in Irish motorsport and definitely a name to look out for. So, uh, James, afternoon, how are you keeping? I know it's early over there for you at the moment, but um, you had your, your season opener in, in Birmingham, Alabama, I think, last weekend. How, how did that go for you? I'm, sh I'm sure you're just glad to get the season underway. Yeah, good morning, Shane, or, or good afternoon, as, as you say. Um, thank you for having me on. Yeah, season opener last weekend at Barber Motorsports Park in Alabama. Wasn't ideal, if I'm honest with you. Um, we had a, had a rough weekend of many mechanical issues throughout the weekend, and that's unfortunately how, how motorsport goes. It, uh it's a lot of variables in this game, you know, it's not like uh, football or, or boxing, whatever, where that one individual can focus on themselves and prepare themselves as best they can, which is, is what we do as drivers. But unfortunately, you get into cars, engines, uh, mechanics, um, all these wear and tear items that, that can go at any moment. So we had a very, very strong preseason testing program. We done the official series test there at our motorsports park two weeks ago. We were very fast uh, in the lead bunch and setting the pace in it. So we're excited going back, you know, and uh, rolled off on Thursday for practice with a lot of issues and right the way through into um, qualifying one and, and qualifying two and then race one even as well. We, we started right down the back, past half the field, got up to the, to the top six and then we had a, a gearbox issue to wiring and on the wiring loom came loose and was touching off the, the chassis of the of the car which is carbon fiber and shorting out the whole wiring system so it gives you an idea of how much how much how much can go wrong behind the scenes and that unfortunately put us out of race but anyhow that that's motor racing um we were very very fast when we were running but just didn't have the reliability there so now we go to St. Petersburg in Florida this weekend and I have full belief in the in the team and, and package that's around me a lot of experience of people and um I know everyone's going to double up on their efforts now for the rest of the season. So that's how it goes at times, but it's it's uh, not for the faint-hearted, that's for sure. Uh, like, you, for people who might not re um, have heard of your background, whatever, I know you you, you worked in your dad's garage, <clears throat> excuse me, mm -hmm. in Nace growing up, and uh, your uncle um, would have been quite a distinguished motor racing figure in Ireland as well. Michael, a legend of motorsport. In fact, he's been inducted into the Irish Motorsport Hall of Fame. So... Maybe tell us a little bit about how, how that background came about. I know you would have played other sports growing up as well, but how did the motorsport love affair begin? So very much along the lines of what you described there. Growing up, always been around a family business in, in Nace, County Calaire. Dad's business is a, is a car garage and a, and a repair shop. So been around it since I could walk, to be honest with you, if, if I recall correctly. And then as I was growing up, started hearing about my uncle's career, you know, as I started being able to, to to understand it and got into it and realized how he was all over the world uh, racing at a professional level indie car japanese sports cars le mans daytona 24 hours you name it all the big stuff so the interest and love was always there between the two um was as i said working then at the family garage of summer holidays and and uh, weekends as you do in, in in a family business and always wanted to get involved in motorsport but the biggest variable in motorsport always comes back to the cost to go at it again. I use, for example, it's not like boxing or football where you go and buy a pair of boxing gloves or a pair of football boots in your way. you got to buy cars, transporters, fuel, tires, you name it, the whole nine yards. So uh, my dad and uncle turned around. It's quite funny and said, look, here's the deal. We have the resources here to run you in a race car with the family repair shop, the tools and the knowledge and so on and so forth. Your uncle has the expertise from his, his, his experience you save up and buy the car and we'll be good to go. So I was 12 years of age or whatever at this time and uh, wanted to get into the Jetta Junior Series in Ireland, which is a class for 14 to 17 year olds entry level. So yeah, I went and worked uh, double, double the amount and I got the, got the money together and purchased my first race car when I was 13. And then we went racing when we were 14. But again, just as fun, you know, we're just going racing. This guy's never done anything. The first race around the podium and p2 and we said geez we better take this a little more serious and uh the rest kind of is history and that's only 2014 and what's really funny um uh, is you know uh, on some social media it gives you those throwbacks from like x amount of years ago on a random day so as i was driving to barber motorsports park last week um it came up on my on my phone that seven years ago last wednesday 
I'd done my first ever race, never done anything before. So it was kind of one of those moments where you're saying, wow, geez, seven years, we've come a long way in seven years to go from never having driven a race car before, buying it myself to going through it all, you know, two years in the UK in Formula Ford to coming over here at 18 right after my leaving cert and leaving everything behind and never been to America and trying to figure it all out to winning scholarships over here and doing Formula 3 and winning in Formula 3 and then now Indy Pro 2000 on the Indy car scene in North America. And it's, it's kind of one of those, I wouldn't use the phrase pinch yourself moments, but if you stop for a second and say, wow, seven years to get here, and now only a step or two away from IndyCar, which is the pinnacle of U.S. motorsport. It's kind of a kind of came before you realize you're here, you know, kind of moment. Just been a, been so so fast. Yeah, it's like it's an extraordinary uh, rise through the ranks for sure. And like when you mentioned 2014, there, like was in the 2014 you became the youngest ever person to race an, an open wheel race car in Ireland, which. Yeah. I think it, you were 16 years in one day, um, yeah, that's right. <laughs> which is just, which is just insane. I mean, for, for people who might not be aware, open wheel, uh, you know, the, the wheels of the car outside the, the main body, there's usually one seat. Uh, so what you'd see in formula, you know, one, two, three exactly. in Indy car, as exactly. you mentioned, what was that, what was that experience like as a 16 year old? Did you feel, did you feel at home in the car at that stage, a car with that power? Yeah. You know, it's, 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 it's something uh, and it's very, very hard to describe to maybe listeners who don't understand it, but as a race car driver or someone who loves a sport, anytime you do something that requires more skill set, it kind of just sparks your interest further. And that's that's the way I describe it. You know, I drove, it was my first time driving a single seater. After my first session, that car I said, I only want to drive single seaters now, you know, it, because it, it, it puts you in a new environment that you didn't realize um, was there. So, yeah, it was very 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 cool and um it was great to get it and that came from what we done that previous year was it was a prize drive and uh something just that's a little unique you know you, that's going to stay forever youngest person ever to drive a single seater in ireland and i think it was just lucky the way it worked out because you have to be 16 to drive one in ireland or to race one according to motorsport ireland i turned 16 today prior so <laughs> we uh we strike that one at the right moment yeah, you didn't hang around for sure. Yeah. Uh, like the 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 move to America then when that when that happened was it April twenty eighteen? So you, I said you were what twenty two now, so you're nineteen, moving over there and yeah. you're basing yourself in Indianapolis. Like, what 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 has that been like for someone that young to be kind of going over, starting a new life, uh, a new culture, I guess as well to be getting used to? What was that experience like for you? Yeah, you know, it was it was an interesting experience for sure. I was I actually 18 because I, I'm this is my fourth year here so right after I did my leave in Southern Ireland in in 2017 and then had the winter in Ireland uh getting everything figured out and I knew I always wanted to go to America you know there, there was just something there that made me want to come here I don't know why it was just something that I wanted to do I had never even been to America at this point even on holiday so I knew nothing about the country my family worked over here back in the 80s and obviously my uncle had a successful career in the 80s here too um and then the america the american system from motorsport standpoint especially on the road in the is very attractive for someone trying to make it because the winner of each championship gets a scholarship fully funded to go to the next level so if you win in europe you essentially just get a clap on the back and you're told well done whereas over here there's initiative you know and there's championships willing to back drivers. So that being a main reason came over and um, worked very hard to get placed with a team in, in F2000 series, which is the probably the second level of open wheel racing here in America. It's kind of semi-pro uh, level and, and got with a team in, in Wisconsin of all places um, who wanted to get into a championship. It was a new championship called F2000, but they needed to perform and they said, um well we're willing to give you a deal but it's going to be what's called a performance deal so you, you do race by race and if you're not performing you're packing your bags buddy kind of thing <laughs> so uh at 18 obviously i'll never forget landing in chicago uh o'hare airport and the air which i think is one of the second and third biggest airports in the world uh, the plane landed and it was like a couple of mile drive to the to the gate and I was Jesus Christ this country is huge you know this before I even saw the place I couldn't believe it come from Dublin airport you know um so I got out and uh just had to figure things out it's kind of you know 
one of those sink or swim moments. You're in America, 18 years of age by yourself, no car, no apartment, uh, never been here, everything new. You have three bags with yourself and go to Wisconsin to a race team and uh, figure it out from there. So thankfully the year went very well with wins and lap records and podiums and stuff like that. So I worked very hard that year, if I'm honest, even just when I wasn't in the car racing myself, going to other races and other events, getting my name out there, meeting teams, doing whatever it took really uh, to put my immerse myself in the American scene right off the get-go. And literally, as I said, from the minute that plane landed in Chicago to I left the end of the year, it was it was flat out, you know, making use of every moment that was here. So it was great. And it brought me on a, a huge amount, even as a person, you know, as I say, 18 years of age, far side of the world by yourself, all your friends are in college, just starting college, having a great time, all your family are back home. It's It really makes you push on as, as an individual when you're in that kind of environment it's 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 a crazy story and like i think irish people love following an irish sporting story abroad when it, especially when there's success with it and when there's a real tangible irish link and, and I, I can recall the jordan team eddie jordan in formula one uh, and and even this this team you're you're with now like turn three motorsport um like I, the way i was reading up on it it's quite an irish operation all around your operation because you have an irish manager uh, mm-hmm. And recently, recently announced this new partnership with Trintec, which you know started off in in, in Trinity, I think, in Dublin, uh, yeah. and it's headed by another Kildare man, Darren Heffernan. And then you have yeah. the Peter Dempsey from Ashburn as the team owner. So <laughs> it must be quite nice to have such a such an Irish link. You have the shamrock on the helmet as well, so you certainly yeah. haven't gone far from your roots. No, no, that that's something that I'm I'm very proud of. And I mean, no matter where you you place me in the world or wherever my career takes me. I'm always going to be Irish and very much from uh, from Ireland. And that's that's something that I think as an international driver in, in a foreign country, you hold on to. So, yeah, yeah, it's great to have an Irish team, obviously, driving for turn three, um, professional team here and on the road to Indy in America, owned by an Irish guy, um, engineers, Irish, the guy who builds the package on our car from gearboxes to dampers is, is Irish. Uh, you're right, Irish partners, the all Irish partner um, and sponsor team from from top compositioning uh, group, the Japanese corporation headed up by an Irish CEO, Ray O'Connor, based out in, in California, who also is from Kildare. Then Darren Heffernan, president of Trintec, came on board. Um, uh, as you said, an Irish, well, originally an Irish company, originated and designed in Trinity College. And now Darren being the president of the company based out of Dallas with a uh, with a huge Irish link being from Kildare and Leakslip. <laughs> and uh, then there's other individuals on board behind the scenes and, and, and partners, some silent ones too, who, who all have Irish, Irish Irish background. So it's really, the funny thing is, it's not, it was, none of it was engineered to be this type of Irish program. It kind of just gelled together naturally, which I think is the beauty of it, you know? Uh, and I, I just realized as I'm speaking to you both, Ray O'Connor and Darren are, are from Galair too, which was not engineered whatsoever. It just happened to be, you know. And the beauty is, is that it's it's it comes across maybe as oh, it's the Irish help and I'd be Irish, but the reality is it's and for what they do and, and and what they put into to to the program and, and and sports sponsorship, as you know, it's all about return on investment. So very, very lucky that what we're doing over here has a huge amount of following. I mean, IndyCar in North America has. 100 million avid fans you know there's higher viewing figures than men's golf and ufc here in america of indycar which I believe it's 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 crazy so it's it's a, a huge opportunity for for me as a an individual or us as a team to 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 bring a company or companies to a paddock or a, a sporting scene with such a following and um bring return on investment and, and drive the companies forward so it's 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 great to be able to do it with Irish people, but I'm also very, very lucky that we have such a platform to do it on. I often think, just as you were speaking there, like an, an, an Irish background can often mean, in a sporting sense, you play loads of different sports growing up and watch loads of different sports and not just focus on one. Like I'm thinking in my head of Tyg Furlong and the Irish rugby team, who would have played GEA, Katie Taylor, even iconic boxer who you know played international mm-hmm. level soccer as well. And I know for yourself growing up, you know, you were into. Uh, certainly at least watching, you know, rugby, following the Green Bay Packers in the NFL, I think I read as well, yeah. into watching boxing. Um, yeah. And even now, you know, the, like water sports and things like that as a hobby. So like, how important was that for you? Maybe, ha- I guess, dipping your toe into loads of different sports growing up? 
Well, I, as I said, I did start motor racing very late, only in 2014. So I was, I was born in 98. So I had a lot of years to fill there. <laughs> and um, I done everything from football, played with Kill GA and, and Candy Kildare, school team and, and club team, um, fo- Gaelic football, hurling, played rugby with Nace Rugby Club, uh, golfing, everything that that you would do as a, as a kid, you know, you, you try everything and, and love sports I mean, played three or four, four sports at a time. And it was only when racing started getting serious that I had to make that conscious decision. You know, do you want to keep going with sports here or do you want to focus on motorsport because better going to clash or you're going to get an injury in one or the other and, and put the other out. So motorsport was what I went for. And um, yeah, I wouldn't change a thing. I mean, I think growing up in Ireland is not part of it too. You know, you, you play everything and, it's a way of socializing and, and hanging out with friends in Ireland um, as, as, as a young kid. I know, obviously, growing up, you would have, and, and well, certainly now you'd have ambitions of, of racing in the Indianapolis 500. And like I was in, I just happened to find myself in Indianapolis in, I think it was October of 2019, mm-hmm. uh, and did the tour of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And, you know, you, the, you've got the yard of bricks where they kiss the bricks and drink yeah, their yeah. milk and, and gasoline alley and all this sort of thing. And you can really feel the history of the place. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, you're obviously basing yourself in Indianapolis now. Like, what, what was your first visit to that uh, motor speedway? Like, I'm sure you you felt the history as much as anyone does when they visit. Yeah, so very quickly on that, it was a, a crazy experience. Again, this shows how fast things progress. So back in 2018, I was in America for two months at this stage. Sorry, no, a month. I got here in April. In May of 2018, I got a phone call from a team to ask would I go and do a one-off event at the Indianapolis Grand Prix uh, uh, in a road Indy series to step in for one of the drivers who couldn't make it in for visa reasons. I said, absolutely. Still hadn't, in America, four weeks at this point, 18-year-old Irish kid, went to the Indianapolis Grand Prix, 100,000 people there watching it, uh, competing in the race, and the top five on our debut there. But that moment of when I got there, to your, to your question, was just, Mind blown, really. Like, like it's home of the biggest one day sporting event in the world, obviously, pre COVID, unfortunately. But there was 300,000 people there a day for the Indy 500. Like, it's unbelievable. Imagine All Ireland final day multiplied by a couple of, you know, two or three, maybe four times that amount. Like, it's, it's fascinating. And Indianapolis in the month of May, of all places, is just everything's about Indy car. It's, it's the be all and end all. It's as if the whole city lives off it you know the streets are named after drivers all the indycar teams are based in the area as i say there's so many fans here from from watching it and internally there's the equivalent of an electric picnic going on while the race is on and what's called a snake pit like with dead mouse and all these crazy big um artists and djs playing so it's just a huge environment that you can't really describe and it's just a feeling that is electric really as you know when you have that many people in one place all so passionate and a race going on in the middle of it all with guys doing an average of 220 miles an hour or so, whatever that is in kilometers an hour. It's certainly an exciting uh, day out. Jeez, yeah, it's, it's just fascinating to see it, and I'd love to see it at some point with fans for sure. Um, like I, I was watching, uh, like most people were watching recently, the Drive to Survive series on Netflix. Um, I don't know if you've managed to catch it, but the the it just highlights the arguments even between teammates uh, at Formula One level. Uh, and not not necessarily arguments, but there's certainly a healthy competition at least. Yeah. Uh, you look at Lewis Hamilton and Valtteri Bottas, or uh, you know even at Red Bull, you have Checo Perez now and Max Verstappen, all vying to be the number one driver at the team. And um, mm. it might be quite different in in Indy Pro 2000 at the moment. But are there moments of of aggro uh, or at least healthy competition between drivers, not necessarily in the same team, yeah. but on different you know, teams? It, it, it's something that. I only spoke, I was on a podcast recently with, with one of our partners and we're, they were asked a very similar question and I had to think about it for a second but because I, I never had to think about it, it's kind of presumed it was a norm, but if you picture it, you know, you and an individual have to work together, say, say if you take a race weekend Thursday to, to, to Sunday, you, know, you qualify on Saturday morning, but for all day Thursday and all day Friday, you and that teammate are required to work together and make the cars or the package better than everyone else. So that's why you're there for that team. You know, you're giving them feedback and the engineers feedback, ideas, suggestions, fine tune everything. Then all of a sudden comes Saturday for qualifying. 
you two guys are expected to compete against one another. Now you've just given that individual maybe, or maybe the other way around, a lot of information for, for two days straight and made their package better as an overall. And now you're, you've worked with them. Now you're going to complete mind switch. This is my rival and you have to beat him because if your teammates beat you, never looks good. So it's a sport like no other, you know, um, it'd be like saying to the Irish rugby team that they have to work with the Welsh rugby team two days prior to the Six Nations final. And then on Saturday evening, you boys are going to play against each other. Like you'd say, that's just mind blown, but that's exactly how the sport works. So yes, naturally that, that sparks tension, that sparks huge rivalry, that sparks some guys playing games and holding back information, which ultimately holds the whole team back. So it's different in every scenario. Uh, some cases you have to hold your cards close to your chest and others, but the reality is in this sport, it's such small margins. You know, we deal in 1%. So we're talking about a tenth here, a tenth there, half a tenth here, half a tenth there of a second. You, know, you can't even time that on your watch. It's, it's so minute. And um, fine-tuning cars so much, adjusting stuff to mills and half a mills. Like, it's, it's, it's crazy. So it is, it is a pressure environment in a unique scenario where you to do something along those lines with a teammate. And naturally, that just sparks uh, rivalry and competition. But that's what makes the sport, you know. I, I don't think you'd have it any other way. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, and the thing about your background as well, you, you know, you haven't grown up going around these tracks. It's not like at 12, 13, 14, you were driving around these tracks. Like another one of the tracks I was lucky enough to see with my own eyes was the, was the Circuit of Americas in, in, oh, in, yeah. in Austin. And like, no, I was there for a Willie Nelson concert. I wasn't there for, <laughs> for a Grand Prix or anything. So a totally different reason. But Get a better idea. Even better idea. But like last November, uh, you had, uh, wasn't it three top seven results, including a top five? Uh, this is where the US Formula One, when, when it happens, is often held, uh, mm. certainly in recent years. Like, what, what, what was that? I know it's a, quite a technical track, but it's still, it's still very fast. Um, what, what yeah. was that experience like in Texas? That was, that was amazing. And, you know, that weekend we actually were to be supporting the Formula One Grand Prix, the US Grand Prix, but they didn't come to America because of the pandemic. So mm. we raced there as, as the main event. And um, that was amazing because... You're at a track again, as you said, with so much history to it, so much atmosphere around it, state of the art, uh, really, really amazing track. A lot of elevation change. I don't know if you saw it coming up to turn one, you climb the equivalent of 14 stories on the way up to the braking zone and then all out to the back. It's super high speed flown sections, um, really long back straight. I think it was the highest speed in the Formula 3 car last year in, in Texas. So track was was awesome. Um being in, in in Texas was also very cool. It was my first time there, and it's only 15 minutes from downtown Austin. So uh, that was a unique experience for sure, seeing, uh, seeing the nightlife in Austin. It's like one of the best cities in, in America to, to, for nightlife. So uh, to be there in a race weekend, obviously not in the thick of it, but just to, uh, to see it all happening was, uh, was cool. And, yeah, Texas is just a unique state that I think uh, – everyone loves when they visit because they're in their own world down there and it's uh, certainly fun. Yeah. It's a, it's a crazy place and a beautiful, beautiful kind of way. Uh, Texas. Absolutely. Uh, you've done, you've done a lot of work, James, as well with the, uh, is the allergy and asthma network. And this was quite yeah. interesting. Uh, side note that, you know, you've, you've suffered, I guess, with asthma throughout your childhood, but uh, you have the, the organization's logo, I know in your car as well, and, and you're working to raise awareness uh, it's an it's an invisible um, but extremely challenging condition. So what what was that like uh, suffering from asthma growing up? And I'm sure it wasn't easy, uh, you know, being around fumes and cars as well. It can't yeah. really help the situation. Yeah, no, for sure. It, it's certainly not 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 an easy condition. I was diagnosed with it, I think when I was eight or nine years of age, and um, had it growing up quite bad, uh, especially in the winters in in Ireland when sweater got cold and it hindered things from a sports point of view or competing in sports, I had to be very careful um, and always carry inhalers. But I had an uncle who who'd actually died from an asthma attack many years ago when he was 10 years of age. So it has a, a serious note when the family obviously lost a family member from it. So really the bottom line was when I turned professional in 2019, was in Formula 3 and I got my first win in Formula 3. I rode American, Wisconsin in front of 8,000 people you know that's all great and that winter when I was home with my family and we we're just having dinner and chatting and 
see, you know, talking about random stuff. I said, something just clicked. I said, you know, now we're actually racing in front of fans. It's a platform. Asthma is a, a serious thing. Jeez, I think I should be doing something to raise asthma awareness and utilizing the platform. You know, I'd be a fool not to. Why wouldn't I? I'm given this opportunity and someone should do it. So spoke about it and then thought, what's the best way to go about it? So came back to America and, and then once the IndyCar deal came and been on that package, reached out to um, various different organizations and companies here in America. But the one that 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 really stood out was the Asthmology Network of America because they're across the board, the, the number one asthma awareness network, non-for-profit in, in America who are associated with a lot of the big pharmaceuticals and manufacture all the asthma products. And they do a lot of research and development for them. So it wasn't just awareness. You kind of had, not to say, but you, you are involved in something bigger as well, making or designing products that, that can better people's lives down the road. So um, paired up with Tanya Winders, who's the CEO of the Allergy and Asthma Network, and been, this is our second year together now, and we, we've been having um, a really successful campaign. You know, obviously the pandemic got in the way of a lot of it because we plan to do a lot of stuff at the track with um, young kids who who have asthma or, or, or are struggling with it because the reality is, you know, there's kids out there who let it hold them back and say, "I've asthma, I can't." In America, play American football or can't play baseball, or even in Ireland, there's probably kids who say I can't go and play Gaelic football or whatever that may be. So our idea or our concept is to use me essentially as an example of someone who played all the sports growing up, every sport you can name in Ireland, to come over here and compete in a sport, as you said, with a lot of fumes and and burning materials and tires and traveling at you know, up to 200 miles an hour in places. And our heart rate goes over 160, maybe 170 beats in a race. So you put yourself in, in, an, in an environment where it's not ideal for an asthma patient. And the message is, well, if I can do it, you can do it. And there's no reason why not. So um, we're going to use the platform as much as we can. As I said, COVID, unfortunately, was a bit of a bit of a a hold back on the campaign. However, we've been doing as much as we can, both on media and uh, print and digital media, and that's gone down very, very well. So now um, we're looking forward to, to kicking it off this year as the vaccines roll out and as fans are allowed back in. Um, that program is really only on the up, if I'm honest. Yeah, fair play. No, keep, keep raising the awareness. It's really, really great stuff to see that uh, happening on such a large scale, for sure. Um, finally, James, and you've been great with your time. Um, like you mentioned, the, the individual sports, the nature of the individual sport earlier, and uh, mm. I'm, I always find it fascinating talking to individual sports people about, uh, you know, realizing ambitions and even, even visualizing ambitions and targets before they do them, whether it's writing them down in a diary or even just thinking about them in their head. But you know, you're, you're, as I said at the start, you're, you're 22 now. So what, what, over the next year, three years, five years, what are you hoping to achieve in the sport? Well, the, I came to America with a, with a dream to, or a goal to compete in the Indy 500. And I think we're going to be going hell for leather at that, excuse the phrase, until we get there. Uh, and, you know, the reality is, if, if someone asked me what you want to get out of motorsport, the dream is to compete in the Indianapolis 500, first Irish man to, to do it in many, many years and, and hopefully hopefully win it one day. And, and the goal is to have a sustainable long-term career out of motorsports. So naturally, if you achieve, achieve the dream, you'll be achieving the goal. And if not, um, the goal is the way we, we have to go. But for now, you just keep chasing the dream. It's what we've been doing the past number of years and it seems to be going the right direction. So um, look, I'm, I'm confident uh, we'll, we'll be there. If, if I'm honest with you, I don't see any reason why not. It's a lot of it's just about hard work and, and effort and, and uh, outworking your rivals. And I think as an Irish man over here with a man on a mission, we've been doing that quite a lot. And um, let's just see uh, see where it goes. So we'll, um, we'll have to keep an eye out. Absolutely. Well, listen, we'll keep an eye out for you. Fair play, James. And I know everyone in Kildare, no doubt, is proud of you and everyone in Ireland is proud of you. So keep tearing up those tracks in the States and doing what you're doing. But um, fair play. And listen, best of luck for the next... Thank you. I appreciate it. Great chat with you.